Welcome everybody to uh, the uh, full paper session 11 of Eurovis 2020. Um, this session is about graphs and charts. Um, I'm Fabian Beck, the session chair for this session. Um, and we will see um, a couple very interesting talks on a bit of a mixed set of topics. Um, topics will be graph visualization, two papers on charts, and we will end with a paper on GeoVis. The uh, speakers are from three different continents, different time zones in Australia, uh, North America, and Asia, all joining the conference here in Europe. The first paper will be presented by Amira from University of Sydney about sublinear time force computation for big complex network visualization. Hello, everyone. My name is Amira, and today I will present our paper on sublinear time force computation for big complex network visualization. Nowadays, big complex networks are abundant in various domains and they are ever growing in size. The most popular method to visualize such graph is the force directed algorithm, which works by computing refraction force on each pair of vertices and attraction force on each edge. In total, it runs in quadratic time, which is not scalable for big complex networks. Our aim is to have a sublinear repulsion force computation that still maintains a good quality layout. In this paper, we present a framework for a sublinear force computation, the SL or sublinear algorithm, which is a sampling to reduce repulsion force computation, the SS or sublinear spectral algorithm, which use spectral sparsification to reduce attraction force computation, and then we implement and evaluate the SL and SS algorithms on runtime and quality. Previous works on force-directed algorithms include the multi-level algorithms, which reduces the runtime to O and log N in practice, and examples include FATE and FMQ. And most recently, the RVS algorithm was presented which reduces the runtime for repulsion force computation to linear. This is done by computing repulsion forces only on a pair of a subset of the vertices. First is U, the update set of size V to the power of 0.75, and selected using a sliding window on an array of randomly ordered vertices. And then the S, the sample set of size V to the power of 0.25, selected using random sampling. Now I will explain our framework for sublinear time force computation. The framework consists of three steps. In step one, we perform analysis on the graph. In step two, we compute the initial positions for the vertices. And in step three, we compute the repulsion and traction force. In this paper specifically, for step one, we compute the BFS3T rooted at the center of the graph. And in step two, we draw T using a radial tree drawing algorithm. For step 3, first we present the SL algorithm for a partial force computation. The SL algorithm reduces the sizes of U and S to obtain a sublinear runtime. We present different versions of SL based on the sizes of U and S used. So 0702 uses U of size V to the power of 0.7 and S of size V to the power of 0.2 for an O and to the power of 0.9 runtime. 0602 reduces the size of U to size v to the power of 0.6 for o and to the power of 0.8 runtime and 0502 further reduces u to size v to the power of 0.5 for an o and to the power of 0.7 runtime we further define three variations of sl based on how the set s is selected slr or sublinear random uses random sampling slg or sublinear geometric uses geometric sampling and slc or sublinear combinatorial uses combinatorial sampling the random sampling for SLR is straightforward, so we will just explain more on SLG and SLC. For SLG, we aim to better untangle dense areas in the drawing, and we do this by sampling vertices by their geometric positions. To do this, we define a 10 by 10 grid over the drawing area, and we sample vertices in dense cells of the grid with higher probability. With SLC, we aim to untangle hellbore structure that often occurs around the center, which is done by sampling vertices by their importance, in this case, the distance from the center. We do this by partitioning vertices on their BFS level, 
and then resemble vertices in lower level that is closer to the center with higher probability. Next, we present the SS algorithms, which are defined for sublinear attraction force combination for dense graph, where the number of edges is quadratic in the number of vertices. We do this by using spectral sparsification, which sparsifies the graph to O n log n edges while retaining structural properties. The SS algorithms consist of the following steps. First, we compute the spectral sparsification G prime of a graph G. Then we compute a drawing D prime of G prime using an SL algorithm. And then we compute the drawing D of G by adding back the removed edges to D prime. We further present three SS variations based on the SL algorithm used to draw G prime. SSR uses SLR, SSG uses SLG, and SSC uses SLC. To evaluate the SL and SS algorithms, we perform experiments using a mix of synthetic and real-world datasets presented in the table here, and we evaluate them based on runtime and quality metrics. For quality metrics, first we use the shape-based metric, which measures how well drawings represent the graph structure, and we also use the edge-crossing metric. In the first experiment, we compare the different versions 0 0.702, 0602, and 0502 to RVS. In experiment 2, we compare the SL variations to RVS, and in experiment 3, we compare the SS variations to RVS. In the first experiment, we compare SLR with different versions to RVS. The different versions have different sizes of the set U, and we hypothesize that all versions run faster than RVS, and more specifically, 0502 runs the fastest, followed by 0602 and then 0702. We also hypothesize that all versions obtain better quality metrics than RVS due to the smart initialization method we use. So for the runtime improvement, we compute this by using the difference between the time taken by RVS minus the time taken by our algorithm, presented as a fraction of the time taken by RVS. And here we see that all versions all run faster than RVS, which fell this hypothesis one. And furthermore, 0502 obtains the best improvement at 28% on average. For shape-based metrics, we use a slightly different formula, as in this case, a higher shape-based metric is desirable, but we still have the difference between the value obtained by our algorithm minus the value obtained by RVS expressed as a fraction of the value obtained by RVS. Again, we see that all of 0702, 0602, and 0502 obtain significant improvement over RVS, which will this hypothesis too, and furthermore, 0502 actually obtains the largest improvement at about 119% on average. For edge crossing metric, we use the same improvement formula as with runtime. And again, here, all of the different versions obtain significant improvement over RVS at over 28% on average, with further validates hypothesis 2. From experiment 1, we see that version 0502 obtains the best runtime with comparable quality metrics to the other versions. So in experiment 2, we compare the different variations of SL with version 0502 to RVS. Here we hypothesize that all of SLR, SLG, and SLC run faster than RVS, and also that all of the variations of SL obtain better quality metrics than RVS. With the runtime, we see that all of the SL variations run significantly faster than RVS on average, and also that SLR and SLC obtain the best runtime improvements of, uh, compared to SLG. This still validates hypothesis 3. For shape-based metrics, we again see significant improvements over RVS for all SL variations, all of them obtaining over 90% improvements on average. And again, with edge-crossing metrics, all SL variation obtains significant improvement over RVS, and in this case, we can see that SLG and SLC obtain the best improvements at over 30.7% on average. So the result for on both metrics validates hypothesis 4. And further, we also present the visual comparisons of the results of the SL algorithms 
compared to RVS. Here, we see that the SL algorithms untangle graphs significantly better than RVS, which further validates hypothesis 4. In experiment 3, we now compare SS algorithms to RVS. And again, we hypothesize that all the SS variations run faster than RVS, and that all the SS variations obtain better quality metrics than RVS. For runtime, we again see that the SS variations run significantly faster than RVS, with SSR and SSE again obtaining better improvements on average than SSG, and this validates hypothesis 5. For shape based metrics, we see that the SS algorithm obtain even more improvements over RVS. And in this case, we see that SSC and SSD obtain the best improvements at over 134% on average, better than SSR and the SL variations. It failed this hypothesis 6. On edge crossing metrics, we see again that all the SS variations obtain significant improvement over RVS. And in this case, we can note that SSC obtains the best improvement at what 27% on average, which further failed this hypothesis 6. And through visual comparisons, we again see that the SS algorithms untangle the structure of the graph significantly better than RVS, which again further validates hypothesis 6. In summary, we've seen that SL and SS obtain significant runtime improvement over RVS, average over all different variations is about 20% and 28% improvement respectively. And SL and SS also obtain significant quality metric improvements over RVS on both shape-based metrics and edge-crossing metrics. The smart initialization contributes to the better quality metrics and visual comparisons of our algorithms. And the best result we can see when we integrate combinatorial sampling and spectral sparsification, that is SSC, most notably it obtains 15% better shape-based metrics than SLR. So in conclusion, we've presented the first sublinear force computation framework with the algorithms of SL and SS, and compared to RVS, both SL and SS are significantly faster and obtain significantly better quality metrics. For our current follow-up work, we are looking to integrate the framework with different analysis and initializations, and also we are looking to present a sublinear time attraction force computation for general graphs and not just dense graphs. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the presentation, Amira. Um, so I think we have some questions. Um, so the first one is about the graphs you use in your experiment, about the average size and uh, order of the graphs. I'm not sure what order means here, but I think size is clear. Um, so can you comment a bit on the data you used for evaluating your approach? So uh, for the data set I use, so I also put um, some of the sizes in the slide before, it might be a bit too fast, but about, um, on average they have uh, about 5,000 nodes with some bigger um, instances approaching 20,000 nodes. For the synthetic graphs, we um, partly try to uh, emulate the scale-free networks with globally sparse uh, structure, but with locally dense areas. Okay, thank you. I think that answers the question. Um, so we have another one by Kostan Tominski. Is progressive or an incremental implementation possible here? So I think if you need to update the layout. Mm. So this was actually implemented in D3, which does allow a, a lot of uh, modification. So I think it, it should it also should also be possible if you take this layout and then you want to incrementally improve it from there. Okay. Is, is that the question? Maybe Christian, you can quickly comment. Did that answer? Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, um, so another question it relates to these projection methods like PSNI, UMAP, and so on. So can your method possibly improve such embedding algorithms? So can you also use it for high-dimensional data? Mm. 
So we have not tried it, but it is something that we have considered for future work to um, to modify this approach for um, TSNE or MDS and similar embedding for high dimensional data. Okay, but you haven't tried it out yet. Future, yeah, so it's future work. Okay. Um, so let me check the chat if there are more questions. Maybe I can also ask one then. Um, so you use the shape-based metric for evaluating. Could you give a bit of an intuition what the, such a shape-based metric measures? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the intuition is, for example, with measures such as edge crossings, this isn't as useful when the graph gets very large. So the intuition for shape-based metrics is you want to see if the shape of the graph drawing is similar to the actual um, structure of the underlying graph. So it basically, you want it to faithfully show the ground truth structure of the graph in a way. OK, thank you. Um, let me check if there are more questions. If not, I can maybe ask a final one. Um, so you choose this RBS method. It's a linear method, right? Linear uh, com yes. time complexity. So what was the motivation to choose this? And what do you think the, the results would have been similar if you would have chosen an, another method that runs maybe an n log n time? Mm. So we choose this be because we uh, we wanted uh, our method that, that com computes the layout in uh, fast uh, runtime and considering that usually for the um, algorithms traditionally they run in quadratic time and even some heuristics only run in O and log and in practice so we thought that if we want to reduce it even further the best comparison would be what is already fastest, which should be this linear algorithm. And uh, runtime-wise, I, I think the comparison might be similar to other oh, and again uh, for certain layouts. Maybe in terms of quality, maybe the comparison might be different. But for, but for this paper currently, we focus on runtime, and for quality, we, we just comparing it to the linear. Yeah, I think if the quality was would it be about the same, um, that would be really great because your method would be much faster than the n log n, n methods. Okay, great. Thank you again. Thank you. And uh, we will move to the uh, next presentation now in the area of charts. The uh, Rise from Stony Brook University will present his paper on infomages, embedding data into thematic images. Hello everyone, I'm Darius Coelho, and I will be presenting my work, Infomages, which is about embedding data into thematic images. This work was supervised by my advisor, Klaus Müller. So let me start off by telling you what Infomages are. Infomages are a type of infographic that consists of a data chart that is embedded into a thematic image. This example was created by Peter Ontoft and shows data about the perception of wearing a burqa in the workplace. So why study Infomages? First, they have been gaining popularity and often appear in newspapers or blog posts. Second, their properties have been shown to be beneficial by previous studies. They contain human recognizable objects and visual embellishments, which have been shown to promote engagement and have also been linked to improve memorability. However, these graphics are difficult to design and have been mostly produced by professional designers. Our work aims to make the design of such infomages more accessible to novices by creating a novel design tool. But before creating our design tool, we first conducted a survey of existing infomages. We wanted to first understand how professionals have gone about creating these graphics and then apply these principles to our tool. So we first collected a set of images for our survey. We used the term photographic infographic to retrieve infomage-like graphics using Google Images and Pinterest. We also used the related images feature of these websites to recursively collect more images related to the initial results. We collected an initial set of 1,638 images. We then filtered the images that did not fit the definition of an infomage, leaving us with 224 infomage-like graphics. 
but it should be noted that we relax the condition for the image to be thematic so that we would have a larger set of images to study. We then use Google's reverse lookup of images to see if we could identify the creators of these images. We found that a large chunk of the graphics, 188 to be exact, were created by professional designers or design firms. We then coded each image based on the type of chart they used, the embedding methods employed, and if the image was thematic or contextual to the data. So let's look at the chart types first. We categorize the graphics we collected into seven categories based on their chart type. The first and most popular is a bar chart, which were present in about 41% of the graphics. Here an image object is used to represent a bar in a bar chart. For example, a man here represents the bars in a bar chart. The second most popular was a pie chart, which was present across 21.4% of the graphics. Here a pie chart is embedded into an image object. In this case, a pie chart was embedded into this man's kipper. The next chart type is a single divided object covering 12.5% of the graphics. As the name suggests, it is an image object that has been divided into multiple regions where the region's length or area represents a data value. In this case, a cake's layers represent the different data values. Next, we have the multiple resized object type, which was present in 11.2% of the graphics. Here, multiple objects in the image are resized to represent data values. In this case, multiple balloons of different sizes represent data values. Next, 9.4% of the graphics consist of line charts. And here an image object like the green straw or edge of the cheese represents data values over time. We also had a few scatter plots, 2.2% of the graphics to be exact, with various image objects representing points, axes, and areas. Finally, all other visualizations that occurred only once, such as sunburst charts or contour maps, were put into the others category, which covered 2.2% of the graphics. Next, we categorize the graphics into four categories based on the method used to embed the chart into the image. The first and most widely used technique is the replicate and transform technique, which was present in about 49.6% of the graphics. In this method, an image object is replicated and then transformed by resizing or repositioning it. In this image, we consider the balloons to have been replicated, resized to represent data values, and repositioned in descending order of the data values. Next, we have the fill method, which was employed in 29.5% of our set of graphics. Here, objects are filled to represent data values. In this case, the men in the image were filled with a texture to different levels to represent data values. Next, we have the overlay technique, where the chart is overlaid on an image, such that the edges or objects in the background have a shape that is similar to the chart. This method is employed in 15.6% of our graphics. Here, the curve created by the mathematical function matches the curve produced by the plants in the image. The final technique we observed was a cutout technique employed in 7.1% of the graphics. This technique is straightforward. Here, the chart is used to cut out part of an image. In this example, a line or area chart was used to cut out the lower part of an image. Finally, we examined if the graphics we collected contained thematic backgrounds. 52.6% of the graphics used thematic backgrounds. For example, this graphic is thematic since it shows the data about the perception of religious symbols at the workplace. On the other hand, 47.4% of the graphics did not use thematic backgrounds. For example, here a piece of cake is used to show data about the reasons for not casting a vote in an election. Based on what we learned from our survey, we created an information design tool that allows users to create such graphics with relative ease. So let me give you an overview of our tool's workflow. The user starts off by loading in a data file. Our tool first retrieves images related to the data. We do this by extracting the attribute labels as well as the name of the data set and use this information to retrieve images from a search engine such as Google Images. We also allow the user to import an external image. Once the images have been retrieved or the user imports an external image, the user moves on to the data embedding process. The user can select from two of the surveyed embedding methods, fill and overlay. Each method supports multiple chart types. The embedding methods can at times cause some chart distortion. Thus, the next step of our tool is to estimate this distortion. Based on previous studies, we develop methods to compute the amount of distortion introduced to a graphic. We also develop methods to optimize a distortion. Once the user is satisfied that the distortion is acceptable, he or she moves on to the post processing step. This involves chart styling, such as changing the colors or adding glows to chart elements, or filtering the background image, as well as styling the fonts, thus creating the final image. 
Due to the time limit, I will only discuss the details of our data embedding and distortion estimation method. Let's start with the data embedding techniques. We focus on the fill and overlay technique in this work. We exclude the replicate and transform technique as it has been well studied and implemented in tools such as DDG, Data Inc, and Infonice. We also exclude the cutout technique as it is straightforward and not very popular among designers. So let's start with the fill method. Given a data set and an image, in this case, data about lipstick brands, we can embed the chart into the woman's lips to create an image. To accomplish this, the user must first roughly select the object region, in this case her lips. We use this marking to guide the grab card segmentation algorithm to segment out the lips and create a mask. This mask is then used to fill the pie chart into the lips and create an image. Our fill technique can be used to support pie charts, a single divided object, or a bar chart. In pie charts, the area can be divided based on the angle, area, or arc length of each segment. The single divided object and bar chart can be filled based on length or areas of the image objects. The other embedding method we support is the overlay method. Here, we have a data set showing the number of UFO sightings reported over the years and an image of a flying saucer attacking Earth. To create an info image, we must overlay the chart on an appropriate image region. We do this by computing the regression line of the data to represent an overall trend and detecting the half lines in an image. We then find a matching half line that has a slope that is closest to that of the regression line. We then use this half line to determine the position of our chart by overlapping the centers of the half line and the regression line to create our info image. With the overlay method, we support line, bar, and pie charts. However, for pie charts, we use half circles instead of half lines. The embedding methods, especially the fill method, add some distortion to the chart. In case of the fill method, the areas, angles, or arc lengths of the segments may not match the proportions of the original data. And in case of the overlay charts, the line or bar chart can get distorted by choosing an inappropriate aspect ratio or changing the range of the y-axis to change the perception of the trend. To report such distortions, we compute the difference between the actual data and the plotted values. In fill charts, we compute the plotted values by measuring the area, angles, and length of segments of the image. We then report the difference between these values and the actual data values as an average percent error across all segments. This error informs the user that on average, their info image may cause viewers to over or underestimate the data value of each segment by the reported percentage. In the case of overlay charts, we detect if the intersection of the X and Y axes is zero, and if the average slope between the plotted data points is 45 degrees as stated by the 45 degree banking rule. We report any differences as a percentage error. In addition to computing the distortion, we also provide methods to optimize the distortion. For fill style charts, we optimize the distortion using the simulated annealing method. This method basically varies the distortion until an optimal level is achieved. Here, we add or subtract random small noise from the data values while ensuring their sum is equal to that of the original values. We then compute the chart distortion, that is the average error based on the area, angle, and arc length. If this error is lower than the previous error, we accept the distortion. We keep doing this until the change in error is extremely small for repeated iterations or if a decay function converges. It should be noted that we also accept higher error values at random. This is done to avoid hitting local minimas. To optimize the distortion in overlay charts caused due to the aspect ratio, we compute the optimal aspect ratio by banking to 45 degrees using the average absolute slope banking method developed by Cleveland. These methods are all packaged into a Windows-based interface shown here. I won't be able to explain this right now due to time limits, but you can check it out in our video. The final part of this work is a user study that tested our design tool. For the study, we recruited five participants, four males and one female, who are all grad students. They were first given a tutorial and allowed to practice interacting with our tool. On average, this took them 21 minutes. Next, they had to perform two main tasks for the study. The first was a replication task where they had to replicate in one overlay chart and two fill charts, a single object and a multiple object fill chart. The second task was a creation task. They were given multiple data sets and they could select any data set they liked and create an info image of their choice. We studied three main aspects. The first is the tool's functionality. The participants took an average of four minutes and 49 seconds to replicate a single info image and 13 minutes and 11 seconds to create one from scratch. It should be noted that they spent more time with the overlay charts, as those charts had more elements to play with around during the process processing, such as line or bar glows, access as formatting, and more. 
Next, we ask participants to rate our tool's usefulness with a 5-point Likert scale. They rated the tool as easy to use with an average rating of 4.3. They also agreed that it was easy to learn with a rating of 4.6, while they gave it a lower score when asked if it performed as expected. They state that at times, the segmentation was not accurate, although it was easy to perform. They also stated that the placement of line charts was not perfect and appeared at locations they did not expect. Second, we asked the participants what they thought of, of the distortion estimation. They all stated that they understood what the distortion values indicated. However, they also stated that they did not know what the level of distortion would be acceptable. Finally, the participants liked our image suggestion feature, but stated that they could find better images on their own, and they did so during the study. To summarize, we conducted a study of existing infomages. And based on what we learned in the study, we created an infomage design tool that helps users easily create infomages as well as estimate distortion in these images. We also conducted a usability study that showed in general users found the tool easy to use. However, this is a first step and there are several aspects that can be improved in the future. The first is to define a good level of distortion. This is an extremely difficult task and requires a large scale user study. The next is to develop a better image retrieval as that is something the users complained about. They also stated that our segmentation and alignment methods could be more accurate, so that is something else that can be improved in the future. And finally, we hope to extend our embedding our methods to a fully automatic approach. Thank you. Thanks, Darius. Very nice presentation. Um, so let me see if we have any questions. Not so far yet. So let me start with asking one then. Uh, actually, this term infomages um, was the first time I came across this term. And I was thinking what could be related terms. So I was thinking like infographics might be related, tangible visualizations, ambient visualizations, isotype. Could you kind of explain a bit about this term? Did you invent it? Uh, where does it come from? What are related terms? Uh, yeah, um, we, we kind of coined the term, so um, we just thought of, um, since we're embedding charts into images and they're kind of used mostly in infographics, we decided to combine the two terms, info and images, so and that's how it came up as info images. Are there yeah. uh, other people using other terms for it? Did you come across? Uh, we what had a workshop paper with some of these images initially, and we used to call them uh, data memes. Mm -hmm. So, okay, interesting. Yeah. So let me check again. Um, yeah, one question by Sylvia Mix. Uh, did you show the your tool to info designers? What was their reaction? Um, we showed it to one graphic designer. Um, they liked it, but uh, of course they said um, like professional design graphics are much better. But one. Um, one major comment that the, the graphic designer said, just about um, infomages in general, is that um, an image has a lot of power to change a person's uh, point of view, and different people uh, look at different at, at the same image differently. So it, you need to be very careful when actually choosing one of these images. I see. Um... So Jeremiah is asking, uh, what database did you use for image retrieval and like image rights was, was an issue there? Oh, yes. So we used uh, Google Images. And it actually has an option to um, use uh, any image that's free to, that is licensed for free use. So it um, filters out the copyrighted images. Um, Gary Scheuermann is asking uh, which part of the work is automatic and what is manual input of the visualization designer exactly? Well, um, the manual input is that he has to define like a rough a region for um, segmenting out an object. So when you're doing the fill style, he has to draw a bounding box around um, the desired object to be segmented out. If it, um, if it's like the segmentation goes wrong or there's like a so a few, few pieces jutting out or something. Then we have a small highlight tool to highlight those um, uh, pieces jutting out or highlight the foreground, highlight the background, just small marks, and um, then run the segmentation algorithm again. We did try doing it with the um, like super pixel based method, but then we had to again um, 
use GrabCut to kind of uh, refine the super pixels because you would not always get an automatic segmentation. For the uh, overlay, it is automatic, as in we overlay it uh, on the half line at the center, but then we allow users to change the position with um, like drag and drop on the, on the uh, line. Okay, yeah, I think that explains the interactions. Um, Kevin is asking about uh, how a picture can provide a contradictory message to the data display. How would you evaluate it? Um, yeah, that is something we haven't actually done, and um, it would need to be. Um, we do think about it like from um, like the new image recognition uh, stuff. Like you could uh, actually label different objects in the image, but um, still, it is it is a very tough uh, problem to solve. So I don't know if I answered the question now, well, but um, yeah. Um, there is a connected one. Uh, is there any guideline to recommend users which picture to use for which chart? Um, there's no, there's no guideline right now in our tool to uh, do that. And we, we actually uh, mentioned that um, it's actually more about the distortion, right? So something more circular or that causes less uh, distortion based on our measures would be more ideal. But then we'd also have to look at color, which some is something we did not look at in this paper. The color of the background, how does it uh, distract from the, the chart? Or is it too colorful? So these things also um, affect the readability of these charts. And stuff. Um, then we have a comment by, by Jason Dykes. I'm not sure there's a question in it, uh, but maybe we can briefly discuss as well. Uh, so he mentioned that the distortion thing is interesting. Uh, many representations contain positional error, for instance, traditional ordnance survey maps of the UK state that 95% of points on a map should be in error by no more than X, where X is a linear distance that is scale proportional. Um, you don't know where the errors are, you just interpret and use the map in the light of the error. Do you want to comment on this or just leave it like um, Okay, uh, so we did, maybe maybe this answer is, a, uh, maybe response is a comment. Um, we did kind of a preliminary study, which is uh, mentioned or uh, dis discussed in our supplementary material, where we try to figure out, um, like in our, in our study, like usability study and stuff, the users were actually wanting to know what is a good amount of distortion, right? Like, how dis, uh, if, if the distortion, which value of distortion is too high. So we kind of ran a small study to figure that out. And I, for the fill charts, like, I think that once our average value reaches about 20%, then people start going really wrong. But below that, it's okay. And I think uh, for the bar charts and the overlay charts, it's like about 15%. So. And we have another comment or suggestion for, for maybe future work, but you can also comment on this if you think it's possible. Did you think about integrating style transfer methods, for example, to adjust the laser from the flying saucer according to the line graph? Pardon? Um, I think they're the last one. So Kuno is uh, suggesting to integrate style transfer methods. I think they are known in computer graphics. If you <laughs> apply the style of one image to the style of another, um, and uh, if that would help here, for instance, make the laser from the flying saucer more look like the line graph. Um, no, we did not think of um, style transfer in that sense, but yes, that would be actually very good to do. But Another thing to think about is when that laser um, represents a line, right? It's kind of really fuzzy, and then at the at the points where the line has like a sharp curve or sharp intersection, then um, the user may get confused or have, again another error comes up there. But um, it would look really nice, and we did actually pass our info images through these uh, style transfer apps to kind of make them look more artistic, but yeah. Okay, I think we we discussed all the questions. Thank you again for your nice presentation and the additional insights.
So we will move to our third presentation. Uh, Tom from Shandong University will present uh, the paper called Canis, a high level language for data driven chart animations. So again, chart. Hello everyone, I'm Tom, a PhD student from Shandong University. And the work I'm going to present here today is Canis, a high level language for data driven chart animations. This is my outline. Chart animations are effective in attracting our attention and maintaining engagement. They can be found everywhere from leading journalism outlets or data visualization blogs like New York Times, Guardian, Flowing Data, and Visualizing Data. Although creating such a fantastic animation is difficult, to help us craft and compelling animations, some keyframe-based and template-based tools have been developed. However, they are either highly expressive but tedious and time-consuming or easier to use but has limited expressiveness. The way that we are familiar with to craft chart animations is to use declarative languages like D3, Vega, or GGAnimate. D3, for example, is a powerful language, but it might be complex to specify an animation since it is not specifically designed for it. As for GGAnimate, it is designed for R, and the generated animations are hard to natively deploy on different platforms. To lower the barrier of crafting chart animations, we present this concise and specific language, Canis, to provide comprehensive support for constructing chart animations. It has high-level grammar that enables specifications of data-driven chart animations and a compiler which automatically synthesizes low JSON specifications which support deploying animations across multiple platforms. Then we conducted two forms of evaluation, creating a chart animation gallery to illustrate the expressiveness and a quantitative comparison of the output file size and rendering performances to evaluate the scalability. Now let's move to the related works. As we mentioned just now, we often use keyframe-based or template-based interactive systems to create chart animations. The keyframe-based tools like Adobe After Effects uses keyframes to set parameters for motion, effects, and many other properties. It could be graphically expressive, but it is time-consuming to fine-tune visual properties and synchronize effects. On the other hand, template-based tools like Flourish provide data-driven templates to enable easy creation of chart animations, but the effectiveness is limited due to the predefined templates. To specify visualizations, we have both low-level grammars, which involve steep learning curve, and high-level grammars that provide concise specifications with out of field omitted details. And Canis shares this similar spirit of high-level visualization grammars. There are UI animation libraries as well. However, they are targeted for animation of general visual elements rather than data-driven marks. And there have been research efforts on visualization libraries to facilitate the authoring of the animated visualizations. Archimbold had all evaluated the effectiveness of animated dynamic graphs in mental mag preservation, while Robertson et al. and Bremer et al. evaluated the effectiveness of animated scatter plots for trend visualization. To help people better perceive changes during chart transitions, here and Robertson developed a taxonomy of transition types and contributed a guidelines for crafting animated transitions. Now I will introduce the design of Canis. Canis has the following three design goals. The first one is high-level specifications. Instead of manipulating the interpolation of visual marks over time, Canis decouples specification from implementation and enables concise high-level specifications for chart animations. The second design goal is meaningful partitions and sequencing. Inspired by the partition operator of Data Illustrator, Canis partitions marks into units in terms of data attributes then maps each unit to one time interval to facilitate meaningful animation sequencing in order to convey data patterns. And the third one is to support cross-platform deployment. A chart animation shows changes of visual marks over time for conveying data patterns of interest. However, sometimes using SVG information alone is not enough, since it is not usually not easy to directly extract accurate data values from the marks. 
As in this example, some marks will be misclassified if we partition marks according to their positions. In this regard, Canis uses a data-enriched variant of SVG, which has three additional properties, ID, class, and datum. ID and class provide index and datum type, while datum contains the associated data. To achieve the third design goal, we define the output as loaded JSON files. Load is an open source library that passes After Effects animations into JSON and renders them in real time on multiple platforms. However, Load is not used for direct programming, thus its syntax is hardly understandable, and it doesn't support data-driven specifications. Creating animations for a static chart is about mapping the effects of marks to their corresponding time intervals. Take this visit scatter plot as an example. Each dot is a mushroom sample and they are grouped by cap surface and order. And the simplest animation would be all dots coming together. The way we specify this animation is to choose all dot marks and let them fade in in a period of time. And in our syntax, taking the DSVG of this chart as input, then we describe this animation as one animation unit in animation's property. The marks can be selected with the selector which uses W3C Selectors API, then specify fade effect for those marks. The compiler will first pass the spike by validating it and setting default values to the unspecified properties as the timing and easing for the effects shown in this example. However, users can override the default values made by the compiler to customize the animation. To convey more data patterns, we usually need to partition the marks so as to animate them in a specific timing sequence. In this mushroom chart, the marks are distributed in multiple beans, and let's animate them successively. With all dots as one unit, we first partition it into rows by surface attribute then get the beans by further partitioning each row by order. After the partitioning, all mark units are organized into a tree structure, which will be used by the compiler to calculate the timing sequence. And the mark unit information are stored in mark unit table and keyframe table respectively, in order to produce the output loaded specifications. To manipulate how to animate mark units, we can further edit current effects or add new ones. And the compiler will translate the high-level specifications of effects into low-level visual channel specifications after passing. They will be stored in animation of effect table and mark channel table. Meanwhile, the keyframe table will be updated. According to the data patterns or analysis tasks, we can specify when the animation of each unit starts with timing specifications, including reference, delay, or duration. And each component can have its own timing, like animation unit, effect, or grouping as what we have in the here. Reference indicates the relative order of the components, including start with previous or start after previous. Thus, in this example, we're making the dots to successfully animate by beans, and the keyframe table would be complete. The order of the animations of units on each level of grouping can be manually specified with sort. When exporting animations, the compiler will translate the data stored in keyframe table to loaded specifications, and the first step is to translate properties in the table to corresponding loaded object properties, and the second step is to remove redundant specifications by extracting static and animated templates. As shown in this example, three bars with different width fit in successfully. They are only different in three properties, width, start and end time. Thus, we extract a static template and an animated template, and present each bar with this animation by applying scaling and overwriting timing. We then conducted two forms of evaluation. The expressivity of chart animations is determined by visualizations and animations. Thus, we use the visualization created by D3, Wigalite, and Charticulator, and animation types mentioned in Emily et al.'s work to create an example gallery to illustrate the expressiveness of Canis. Here are some of the examples from the gallery. To evaluate the scalability of Canis in animating the charts of large data, we perform two comparisons. One is the compression ratio of the template-based translation, and the other one is to measure the performances of rendering our output specifications and these three counterparts. 
Figure A are snapshots of three animations we used. Figure B is the box plot showing the compression ratio of these three kinds of animations. We can see that the bar chart animations have the highest compression ratio as 5.5, and figure C shows the frame rate curves of the line chart animations under five rendering settings with increasing number of lines. We can see that the frame rate of all settings gradually decreases with increasing number of marks, whereas floaty web on desktop is the best. Here comes the discussion and future work. Since Canon separates animation creation from chart creation, it might require more efforts to create transition effects, and we will further enrich the animation types and specification methods, optimize the rendering performance, and build interactive tool for general users. Thanks for your listening, and welcome to visit our project page or try out Canis, our online editor. Thank you for your presentation, Tom. Do we have any questions about this nice work on chat and chart animation? Uh, currently, no. So while you're typing a question, I can maybe start with one. Um, your animations blend in the different parts of the visualization step by step. So they relate to the data. But as far as I understood, they are not showing any temporal data changes. Is that correct? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just showing you. It's just uh, 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 the chart appearance animation and without the uh, time series uh, changing. It, uh, Canis now supports the uh, time, time series data by uh, authoring all the charts all the charts on each time step, and then you uh, use those series of charts as the input and uh, to offering the uh, animations, yes. Uh, so would it be difficult, or could you imagine more support for this time series data that you don't have to manually author all the uh, individual charts and then do manually all the transitions, which is probably why some work still, if there are many time steps involved specifically. Yeah, yeah. We actually we are uh, we are we are doing uh, something on this part because uh, it's a uh, as we said it's a uh, limitation of the uh, current spike. So we are now um, trying to support uh, the the updating of the time series data by just to, uh, uh, by the by just translating the data data changes not without authoring the, all the charts from each step, yeah. Um, what do you think are the uh, motivations for designers to add those animations? So what is the big advantage of, of those uh, animations if you plan in things step by step? Because uh, the chart, because uh, the uh, visualization charts is trying to convey some data patterns and uh, to <clears throat> to animate the parts of the chart step by step is um, can uh, serve as a as a uh, guide for the for the for the user to understand better understand the chart and uh, the data patterns behind this uh, this chart. So uh, yeah. So it creates implicit links or in a, in a sequence that you otherwise might miss and additional guidance for the viewer. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't, let me check the chat, um, but I don't see any questions from the audience. So I'll have some more questions. Uh, I was thinking about interaction. So uh, currently it's kind of, it just plays as a sequence, right? Um, do you think it would be possible to add interactive triggers to the animation that the user does something and then as in reaction, maybe also uh, like selecting some details or so, then only as, as a reaction to this trigger, um, the animation is shown? Yeah, this is a very good question. Yeah, actually we are, uh, we are doing, we are trying, uh, we, we, we are trying, this is part of our future work and we are trying to, uh, we're building a system to uh, use this spike as the uh, core of the system. And uh, uh, in this system, we are trying to implement some uh, interactions to, to, to 
uh, within this uh, animation thing and uh, uh, to let the user uh, animate, uh, interact with the animation. Uh, animation. Yeah. Um, I don't see questions. So maybe then my final question would be, maybe it's also pointing towards future work. Um, with your approach, currently, the designers still need to do a little bit of coding. It's much easier, of course, than uh, implementing it. the same thing with D3, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still a bit of coding, right? Um, so I was wondering what could be a visual user interface for designers who are not trained in coding. Uh, to steer these animations. Yeah, yeah, and uh, as uh, as we mentioned in the uh, future work section, we are building a uh, uh, user interface, like as, well, the system with the user inter uh, graphical inter user interface to let the people uh, just uh, manipulate the uh, graphical elements to to authoring this animation without any coding, and uh, we are <coughs> we're designing some. Uh, some uh, visual language, uh, static visual language, to represent the animation uh, itself during <clears throat> to let the, let the user know what they are building during uh, their interaction in the system. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think no more question. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. And we will move to the last presentation of this session. And uh, it will be in the realm of geo visualization. Yongshi will be talking about visualizing dynamics of urban regions through a geo semantic graph based method. So it has also a connection to the graphs that we are initially talking about. Hi, everyone. In this work, we introduce the geo semantic graph based method for visualizing the dynamics of urban regions. Here is the background of our work. People nowadays are used to taking photos wherever meaningful to them. Social media applications make posting and sharing easy and fast. Often, these applications such as Facebook and Flickr support a hybrid data structure consisting of the photos or videos taken and the textual descriptions of these digital contents. Besides, The shooting devices can recode the geolocation of where the photo is taken. We can see that it is not easy to study and understand the human-involved dynamics based on geographic information. To reduce the complexity of analysis, there are various segmentation methods to divide a large area into smaller parts. In each region, human activities might be dense and share similar themes. Our work tries to identify regions of a specific function by aggregating similar human activities. The functionality is revealed by the semantics of the textual descriptions. For example, whether the region is transportation-related or residential-related. We also focus on representing and interpreting the dynamics of regions, as well as revealing how regions evolve across time. This figure shows the framework of our implementation. We take advantage of the temporal geotextual data. The workflow covers main modules including textual analysis, region delimitation, and region mapping. Before we go any further into these modules, let's have a look at the format of the temporal geotextual data. Each data item corresponds to a discrete geographical venue with a timestamp, a location coordinate, and the textual description information. We connect each venue to its k-nearest neighbors to ensure that only closely located venues will be assigned to the same region. The connection weight is measured by the semantic similarity between their textual descriptions. The benefit of constructing such a geosemantic graph is that we can consider both geographical and semantic proximity at the same time. As the words people use for description are highly diverse, we reduce the complexity by learning topics from the texts. Then the textual part of each data item can be represented by a probability distribution of the topics revealed by the latent Dirichlet allocation model. A topic is essentially a cluster of words. At one time step, we regard the set of unique and meaningful words collected from all data items as the corpus. The textual component of each data item is treated as a single document. Assume there are n topics in the corpus, 
then T V1 denotes the probability distribution of the topics at venue 1. The probability components sum up to 1. The semantic similarity between these two venues is measured by the reciprocal of the symmetric kullback leibler divergence. To update topics, we conduct LDA repeatedly at each time step. From the geosemantic graph, we detect communities by the community detection algorithm, which is known as the Louvain method. The key is to maximize the modularity of the graph. Consequently, venues that are both closely located, and have similar activities types are clustered. Initially, we identify regions by compassing the detected communities with convex hulls. Later, by tiling the polygonal areas with hexagonal cells, we achieve better visual compactness. To understand how a region evolves from one time step to the next, we try to find its target region after evolution. Accordingly, we propose a mapping algorithm to identify different types of transformations. Suppose the current time step is t and the next time step is t plus 1. The first type is that one region at t splits into multiple regions at t plus 1, and the second type is that multiple regions merge into one region. The remaining types are one region maps to only one region. No regions at T match the region at T plus 1. And the last type, no regions at T plus 1 match the region at T. Our mapping algorithm is based on two conditions. First, regions at two time steps overlap geographically, and second the regions have a certain proportion of designated venues inside the overlapping area. Now let's have a look at some real examples. The Flickr data set we use record the activities of users. As shown in the figures, we create migration trajectories, based on the temporal matching results, obtained by repetitively running the mapping algorithm, between every two consecutive time steps. A trajectory is drawn by connecting the centroids of regions chronologically. We then abstract trajectories as graphs which ignore the distance between region centroids and the details of regions, such as their sizes. By applying a standard clustering method, like the k-means algorithm, we can discover a few evolutionary patterns, as listed on the right. Among them, the chain-shaped patterns usually happen at landmark buildings. They are stable, and region centroids at different time steps are very close to each other. By referring to the associated keywords of the dominant topics, we can deduce what the landmark is. The keywords of the Central Park are listed here. We use timeline-based visualizations to show the temporal evolution of regions. Thumbnails denoting a specific area of interest are aligned horizontally. Mapped regions are linked between two time steps so that it is convenient to track the evolution of a specific region. A rich set of visual techniques facilitate the comparison tasks and the inspection of the region details. For example, the histogram stripes on the top and left sides of thumbnails encode the distribution of venues along the longitude and latitude directions. Now, let me show the demo of how our visual system works. The visual interface contains an overall view and a comparison view. In the overall view, users can observe the distribution of activity venues. Each venue is denoted by a green dot. By clicking the dot, the uploaded photo is presented. Since venues might be heavily overlapped, switching to the heat map view helps to identify dense areas. Users can also select a specific time period in a landmark to view the evolutionary trajectory. Here we select the Times Square for example. Centroid at each time step is represented by two concentric circles. The opacity of the inner circles indicates the time order, the darker, the more recent. And the color of the outer circles implies the number of human activities around the region. The warmer the color, the more frequent the activities. Consequent centroids are connected by curved lines. For landmarks, the positions of centroids are often close and we see that some of them overlap. By clicking the centroid, users can investigate the time step and the region territory. 
We tile the region area by hexagonal cells for improving the visual compactness. We can also select an area of interest in the overall view. Then, the details are displayed in the comparison view, where we can conduct temporal comparison tasks. Thumbnails of each time step are aligned horizontally along the timeline. Consecutive thumbnails are linked by a set of curved lines, according to the matching result of regions. These lines go through a stack of rectangles, each rectangle denotes the type of region evolution. The rectangle width encodes the number of the intersected lines. By clicking a centroid, two heap map strips are brought into view. They show the distribution of venues along the longitude and latitude dimensions. The darker the color, the denser the venues. Besides, the selected keywords are displayed in boxes in the intermediate space. Thank you, Yongxi. That presentation. So, do we have any questions? Checking the chats, chat windows. So, let me start with one question. Um, so, you were using some some clustering algorithm to uh, create those regions and then track them over time, right? Yes. Um, so I was wondering if you come, came across any issues with kind of instable clustering, flipping back and forth between two kind of stable states. Um, was that a problem or did you somehow counteract that problem already? Uh, you mean you mean you find the different uh, communities at uh, two different steps, right? Two time steps, right? So for instance, that one community is splitting and merging all the time with it between every time step is basically toggling back and forth. Uh, yes, yeah, so this might be an issue, but uh, we can use uh, the matching algorithm to find uh, these uh, uh, to find uh, these uh, regions because uh, for every two consecutive time steps, we match the community, we match one community, uh, compare one community with all its uh, nearest communities so that we can see if a community is split into multiple uh, if, if it uh, spillates to multiple uh, communities or uh, uh, multiple communities that just merge into one. Yeah. Um, those landmarks, they are stable on the map. So it's cool that your algorithm also keeps them kind of stable, but still they are moving around a bit, right? Yeah. Could you imagine to somehow, to somehow extend the approach that these are these landmarks are automatically detected and kind of maybe removed or I don't know just marked as a static region because that's they will never change their position really right yes yes first uh, first of all you can see that uh, the centroids the these those circles are just move around because of these centroids uh, these circles are the centroids of uh, human activities uh, are where the activities happen, but uh, you know, people always move around, right? Even they are at a uh, landmark, uh, the activities might happen around that around that place. So I think it's uh, normal to see that uh, the centroids just uh, move around. But uh, you, if you want to, uh, if you want to find uh, where exactly the landmark is, I think we need other information. Yeah. Uh, so you would notice, for instance, if there would be a construction site and you can just access the landmark from a different direction or so, you would notice that in your data, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, talking a bit about granularity, so I think in your samples you showed in the presentation, you had years, different years um, as mm. time steps. So I was wondering if you could also do the same thing on a uh, finer gran temporal granularity like weekly, monthly, or even daily patterns. Uh, does it work? Did you try? And uh, yeah, what's your comment on that? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The time, gra uh, the time granularity just uh, depends on the applications, right? But uh, we uh, here in this uh, in this work uh, we use uh, two data sets. One is Flickr collect the data collected from Flickr and the other one is collected from Europe. And uh, 
so if you want to do finer granularities, uh, first of all, it depends on the data, but okay. uh, I think it's possible. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's totally possible. And uh, another thing is uh, that uh, uh, for some specific data sets, I think uh, the uh, human acti uh, the differences of human activities between, like you say, if uh, between one day to another, I think the differences uh, might be quite small. So uh, if you if you make the granularity too small, it will just uh, increase the computation cost. I think uh, uh, there should be a trade off. Yeah. I see. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Kevin is asking. If you have considered the integration of contextual data, I would assume something like okay, landmark data or, or I don't know, street street maps or yeah, something like this. Yeah, yeah, I think I think this is uh, this is good because uh, uh, if I understand his question, his or her question correctly, I think uh, uh, she he or she just uh, suggests the views of the different data sets, right? Yeah, you, you, yeah, you integrate use, but, different data sets with, I think, the data you already have. Yeah, that would be quite good because uh, uh, then you can increase the accuracy of, uh, of finding the regions, especially you can better interpolate the semantics of those uh, region functions. And uh, uh, actually, there are previous work of, uh, who uh, who collect data like from Foursquare or some or some other sources. I think this is, this can be good. Yeah. Um, I didn't see another question, so maybe let let me ask the final question. Then uh, we've talked already about uh, temporal granularity. What about uh, spatial granularity? So could you do the same on a national level or? Even worldwide data is not possible. I think uh, uh, theoretically it should be possible, but uh, you, you see that uh, we also uh, for the for the whole pipeline. This uh, this uh, this uh, this can be implemented. Uh, only one thing is that we tire the regions, the uh, the detected communities. So we tire them with the hexagonal cells, right? But if you want to do it at the national level or the or the global level, I think the uh, the tiling the tiling computation would, uh, would be very high. Yeah, that that could be the bottleneck. But for other parts, I think uh, this can be done. Uh, also, you can if you want to do that uh, do the do the work at the, at a larger scale, you can maybe you can use the sampling techniques. To uh, to minimize the size of the of the of the semantic graph, but uh, there there would be some uh, some 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 loss in the accuracy. Yeah. So I see that scalability then is an issue. You could of course use coarser grain data, but then probably you wouldn't see any any movement, right? Yeah. Okay. Then thanks again yeah. for your Thank work you. and the presentation. So I think that concludes our session on graphs and charts. Thanks all for contributing, all the speakers. Thank you again, but also thanks to the audience for asking those questions and your interest in the work. Enjoy the conference. Goodbye. <laughs>